Uh, we're going to start. Yeah. And first, we'll go to our dear, dear friend, a true person beautifully created. He's shaking his head. <laughs> no. Right now. But no, that is so true. I, I do have a request um, for all of us here. I beseech you to as often as you can pray for people in Ukraine and also for people in Russia. I am not of the opinion that every Russian is like Putin. No, thank you. No, and I just look around the room at our faces and who we are. That's who you will find in the Ukraine. You know, living in suburban of cities, living in big cities, uh, using public transportation, just like us. And it's hard to believe that this is happening. <clears throat> so we, may we keep them in our prayers, dear God. May we keep them in our hearts, dear God. And may we pray for peace, but also for safety. And anything that you feel comfortable in doing to help, please follow. Thank you so much. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, it's great to be back. It's great to be back and to begin to feel like we're back in the church, you know, and all that. So here we are. So this is set part two, uh, part two of um, an earlier presentation about a Polish Lutheran coal miner in Scranton uh, from Suwałki and the story of Polish Lutheranism. Um, it was my dissertation at the University of Michigan, and uh, I researched how Polish Lutheranism was birthed, and then um, I had created the dissertation around the eight German Polish Lutheran congregations in the United States. Okay, so you probably never heard of them. No. Okay. Is that your dissertation? This is my dissertation. Wow. That whole book. That whole book. Wow. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> this is the hymnal. This is the hymnal that you see there. And so this hymnal uh, he brought with him from Suwałki when he emigrated. How did you get it? Ah, okay. <laughs> yes. um, I, when, um, when I was uh, writing the dissertation, I visited as many congregations as I could, and the pastors would line up interviews. And so I interviewed his daughter in Scranton, Pennsylvania, Helen Norkaitis. And we talked for about an hour. And at the end of it, she said, would you please take this? Um, nobody reads this any longer. It's his hymnal, uh, my father's hymnal. And I think you would appreciate it. So uh, this is the hymnal. You see the front, you have this wonderful leather binding. You have these metal, what we call bosses to protect it when you put it down. Um, you have these little, I call them tax, so it protects it. Um, when you were in a Polish Lutheran, you, when you took this to church, you would have wrapped it in a towel. And when you, after you used it, you always kissed it before you, you put it down. So Helen told me that her father, who was never in front of school, but knew how to read and write, would spend many nights under, in the corner with this hymnal, and it has a prayer book in it as well. And she said he would, he would uh, sit there hour after hour reading his hymnal, in the prayer book, and then what he did is, uh, well, let's talk the, in the back corner, the back cover, you have a chalice. <clears throat> this is a symbol for Lutherans in Slovakia and in Poland. Um, instead of wearing a cross, you would wear a chalice, <clears throat> and that would distinguish you as a Lutheran because wow. a Roman Catholic would not receive wine at the at mass, but Lutherans would. Wow. That's just a little bit subversive. <laughs> I know. <laughs> Part of the stimulation to write about this hymnal was a book I read uh, a few months ago, a hymnal a reading history, and it brought up, percolated a lot number of ideas. And so I said, I want to do this. So, and what I could not have done, yes. When and where was that hymn book published? I'm going to get to that. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> I anticipated all the questions. <laughs> you see, it's not just me. <laughs> yeah. yeah. All right. So this is the part of the world where we're headed, East Prussia. All right. East Prussia is now Northern Poland. Um, but this was called East Prussia 
And there is exactly the region. East Prussia and Subalki is its next door neighbor, okay? So we're in the Northeast corner of Poland and uh, it, Königsberg is the capital. And so here we have it. The story starts in 1228. Uh, it needs to start somewhere back there. And it starts because of the Teutonic Knights. They are invited by Conrad of Nozovia, who is having problems with the Prussians, who are non-Christians invading his territories. He invites the Teutonic Knights, which were a religious military order, come, settle, and, and take over the Prussian territories and basically subdue them so that they stop <laughs> causing problems in my neighborhood. All right? So these are the regions of the Teutonic Knights. You have East Prussia, Lithuania, Latvia, Estonia. These are where the East, this is where the Teutonic Knights set up their, their base of action. They were supposed to convert the non-Christian people to Christians. Instead of boring them with a sermon, they usually bored them with swords. So, um, so it was a bit, uh, you know. Good um, words. Yeah. <laughs> Lithuania at this time was non-Christian. Mm. Lithuania was the last country to become Christian uh, Catholic in 1386. What were they? Oh, not non-Christians. Like just... Non-Christians. Okay. You know, you worshipped a series of gods, usually yeah. trees. Um, <laughs> there was usually a tree that attracted your attention, and so they were they were non-Christians. So here we have it. This is one of the castles mm. that the Teutonic Knights wow. built. There were several of these. They they formed a chain. Um, the way they learned this was that they were involved in the Third Crusade, 1189, with Richard III and um, the French king, Philip Friedrich Barbarossa. And so they learned to build these constructions, these castles, where they would then would leave these castles to launch their, their raids to subdue the Prussians and the Lithuanians. Now let's just move to 1525. The Reformation just started, okay? And here's the last grand master of the Teutonic Knights in East Prussia. He's Albrecht de Hohenzollern, and he gives up and he heads back to uh, Franconia, northern Bavaria, where his family was from. And he just, he's, they have been losing since 1410, they've been losing all of their territory. What you see with the stripes, this diagonal stripes there, that's all they had left of their realm. Everything else they had lost. They had lost to Poland and Lithuania. Okay, so they were on the losing streak for over a century. And so, Albrecht heads back to back to uh, northern Bavaria, and somebody suggests to him, Andreas Oziander, who is the preacher, uh, and won him over to Lutheranism, said, "Why don't you go talk to Luther?" So um, Albrecht wrote, wrote um, Luther, and Luther, he met with Luther twice, and he said, "Well, I have a problem with the Teutonic Knights." And Luther is very very simplistic. He says, "You are a military religious order." I'm sorry, that is a contradiction. You don't need the, the, the force of the sword to enhance the gospel. It will carry itself. So why don't you secularize the territory? So he figures he will. The moment he secularizes that realm, he loses the support of the Pope and the emperor who had offered him the authorization. But he figures if I ask the king of Poland, Sigismund the Old, that I could secularize this realm and we would adopt Lutheranism, you, the Polish king and the Polish Catholic Church, would approve of it. So there are two reasons because we'll approve it. Why would the why would the why would the Polish Catholic Church approve that? See, I anticipate all these questions. <laughs> <laughs> one, one, Sigismund Stary is Albrecht's uncle. So his sister, the king's sister, was his mom. So there was a family time. So number one, he's my nephew. Number two, the Teutonic Knights had been launching raids into Poland and Lithuania for a very long time. So this Roman Catholic order of Teutonic Knights is invading Roman Catholic territory. So if we make them Lutheran, the Lutheranism, it sounds odd, becomes a solution. Because at 1525, no one realized how there was always this call for a church council. Could we resolve? Could we resolve the difference between the two churches? Luther always called for a council. I would like to talk about this in the larger arena. Never, it did happen in Trent, but that was 1546, and Luther wasn't invited because he was dead. <laughs> <laughs> when he died on the peasant's heart, he, he died in his heart. So this is the moment in Krakow, May of 1525, Sigurdsson started with the Roman Catholic Church authorizes 
the creation of a secular state, a Lutheran state of East Prussia. So there you got it. There he is, uncle, nephew. There they are. And so they are all. This is, in, um, this is a Saint Mary's Church Tower is right behind the wall there. The grand, a grand moment. This was painted in the 19th century by a Polish artist named Jan Michalko, and it's a rather huge, uh, a huge canvas. Uh, it was captured this this moment. So here we are. This is a wonderful moment. So now let's head up. Let's see where to 1879, 1882 is when he painted this. So now we have a Lutheran state. All right. Now you hear in your your Lutheran church history, you know, we hear that um, we are the we are a very white denomination. Yes, we've heard this several times. Okay. Well, what we sometimes forget is that we are a very multicultural um, denomination. When he declares this state Lutheran, the, the vernacular supplements Latin. Yes. Uh, in worship. <laughs> Well, I've got three different three different languages that were spoken in this realm, which is now called people Prussian, German, and in the southern districts where that arrow is, Polish, in the eastern districts, Lithuanian. So I now have to find clergy who will be able to preach both in German and in certain districts, German and Polish, and in other districts, German and Lithuanian. That makes sense now. Yeah. Because the Teutonic Knights, these these districts were not well populated. They invited Poles to cross the border from the Soviet into the southern region, and they invited Lithuanians to come and for a deep, you know, land deal, farm, settle here, populate it, fill the land, let's grow crops, and you can pay taxes. <laughs> Carl, yes. what is striking me here as a former history teacher in one of my lives, how powerful religion has been in the way in which history has been rolled out yes. and borders and, and yet it is very rarely if ever incorporated into history. Right. So this is a novel story. But when I said Polish Lutheran, you're all like, huh? Uh, yeah, <laughs> uh -huh. yeah, all right. Before World War II, there were one million Lutherans in Poland. Okay, five hundred thousand Germans, five hundred thousand Poles. Okay. All right. So the blue, the blue up there. Those are the German speaking districts. The red, the dark, and the bright red are the Polish speaking districts, and the green are the Lithuanian speaking districts. Okay? Uh, all right. So, what are we going to do with all of this as we work on this here? The city is Königsberg. That will become the, the capital for this new realm. And what we're going to do is we are going, there's the cathedral. Um, Britain Gothic is what it's called. It was restored uh, after World War II. That was the, the cathedral. The Lutheran Cathedral in Königsberg. All right, we found a university in 1544 to train clergy, and we will have three, we will train them to, to, to help them improve. We create dormitories where, if you're from Polish districts, you go to unit there and you will improve your Polish. We will have a Lithuanian dormitory where you can, you can help your language improve your Lithuanian. There you go. The first president is Georg Savinos, he is Melanchthon's yeah. father in law. So you love history. If you don't you, understand the terms of what to do here, that's the problem. You love history. This man, you would just devour. You would lay at his feet. Oh, dear. <laughs> <laughs> oh, dear. <laughs> Thank you, Where is this <laughs> So there we are. So now you have the, the, the Luther's New Testament, 1523, where you're also going to start. There's the first Lutheran hymnal, 1529. There you go. You're going to do the same thing in Polish. We are now going to start translating scripture into Polish and publishing these books. We will so, and we will also begin creating hymnals. So here's a translation of Matthew by a, a, a Polish scholar, Jan Zaputian. So here we have it. Here is a hymnal. This is a Polish Lutheran hymnal, Kancionau. Kancionau is a polarization of a Latin word. The Kancionau is what the clergy, nuns, priests, would hold when they sang in Latin. So they continued that title. So Kansiona is simply a hymnal, but it's Polish, a Polish hymnal. You've got it. So that hymnal here was created for the region of Silesia, which had several, several very prominent, um, prominent Lutheran districts. And here we are. This is the, the this is a hymnal. So the tradition here, we also will translate the catechism. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. We're going to 
to translate the catechism. So, you know, you can teach catechism. Here's the Kindle in Danzig. This Danzig is in the northern section here. If you have Danzig up there, so we're going to have hymnals. So we have a tradition of translating hymns into Polish, scripture into Polish, catechism into Polish. Yes? All right. So there you have it. Now, what makes this interesting is in the hymnal for Danzig, you see on the left hand side, that's a frontispiece, the engraving of Martin Luther. Wow. There you go. Uh, if you go into the southern hy the sub hymnal in the south, uh, they would include be included in addition to the hymns, Luther's catechism. Oh, you know, compact. You got you worked on it. Here's the problem: the Hohenzollerns, as of 1613, were Calvinists. They embraced Calvinism. So what you have is the ruler is ruling is 90 93 percent of the population was Lutheran. So you now have a disconnect between the throne and the altar. And so this was always a rubbing point. It will be resolved in 1817 when Friedrich Wilhelm III merges the two churches and creates what is called the United Prussian Church. But up to this point, they what they use is pietism. Pietism is not so much about it's a doctrine about your personal experience. You, you, you transcend that doctrinal positions and you talk about a relationship with the living God. So pietism becomes a force that allows them to go above the supra, supra denominational. And so that becomes the major force. So here he is, 90% of the population is losing, 4% are Calvinists. So there's this huge disconnect. All right, so pietism. This is Franke. This is the Franke Foundation that trained Muhlenberg. This was the huge Aldous Hermann Franke. This was the huge pietistic, pietistic foundation in Halle. Um, and so here you, you have this the crown is supporting pietism because it allows me to transcend the, the distinction. All right. So here's the this is the <laughs> hymnal that inspires this hymnal. It is created by Georg Friedrich Rogal. It is pietistic, has a pietistic orientation. You will not see a frontispiece of Luther in the hymnal, and you will not see, you will not see um, Luther's catechism in here. Oh, okay. So this is this is this, this is he is told that the, the person who will create this symbol is told to follow that format, which he knows. There you go. So there's the 1741. There's the Polish, the Polish edition. You see Polish in Fraktor with a Fraktor font. That becomes a cultural hallmark for Polish Lutheranism in the north. It is always with a Fraktor, Fraktor font. Okay, so that's distinguishes that, that sets you apart. Hmm? Proctor, a font. You you have them. You remember? Uh, oh, you have them, so it's just a name of a font. A font. Yeah, okay. And it's the German. It looks. It's, it's <coughs> just like that. You know. Yeah. All right. There you go. So we don't have the catechism, and we don't have a frontispiece with Luther's Luther's uh, with an engraving of Luther. All right. So you see the difference between Proctor right. and Latin. A Latin mm -hmm. font. You do. do, you do. Oh yes, it's in Word. It's oh, in there. No. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> so here you are. So here we now. What is Psalms and Potatoes? Why? Are, where did the Psalms come from? He, one of the great authors in Poland's golden age in the 16th century, was Jan Kochanowski, and he translated all of the Psalms into Polish, and this became a, a huge, was a huge success. All 150 songs were translated into Polish, and in his sort of poetic paraphrasing of the songs, he has this hallmark of being Polish. He also creates a hymn, uh, What You Desire of Us, Lord, Czego uh, Panionash, and that hymn becomes very popular. So it was common in Polish Lutheran circles to have, to have a section called the Psalms of David very early on. We have it now, but this was always part of our hymnals all the way back to the era of the Reformation. So there are 50 songs called the Psalms of David, and there's 50 of them here, and you would sing them just like that hymnal, Psalms for All Seasons. So here we are. They are called Mazurians, and they will move over from East Prussia to Suwałki. So those two, where I just put little circles, they are uh, Polish Catholic districts, but the dark red are Polish Lutheran districts. 
there is a church in Lutheran Church in Suvalki. In Suvalki, they um, just I've been friends with them on Facebook, and they are headed to the border to pick up their refugees from the war. So they are they are very involved in that. Um, there's the inside of the church. You can see the pastor, the Polish pastor with his tabs, Tablicki, and then it's probably a, an American pastor who is uh, talking with him. So there you have it. How old is that church? They go back to, that goes back to the 1700s wow. when they started to emigrate into Suvalki. It looks like a very colonial style. Very colonial, neoclassical. Yeah. yeah. And in the front, on the left, mm -hmm. there's the, no, the next one. Luther on the far left. Oh, yes. It's Dan Martin Luther. Martin Luther 217. <laughs> Martin Luther 217. Okay. <laughs> there you go. All right. Here he is. Now, he arrived in 1907. The ship, he arrived in 1907. Okay. As I was looking at my dissertation, I, his daughter explained that was his second time coming to the United States. The first time he was here, he was here at 1900, and he worked in a mine, and he was told what is called the bird of passage. What that means is they, they were, it was common in immigrants, in, among immigrant, in immigrant communities to be a bird of passage. Meaning you came, you found a job in a mine or a factory, you saved your money and you returned home to either pay off the debt on the family farm or to buy additional acreage. So what is clear is that in 1904, he goes back. <clears throat> All right. 1904, uh, is Tsarist Russia. 1904 was not a good year for Tsarist Russia. <laughs> they entered into a war with Japan. <laughs> Frank is drafted into the Tsarist Russian army. He is put on a train and has to travel 4,000 miles to Port Arthur, in just below Siberia, where he sees combat. And his daughter is explaining this to me, and it's in the dissertation, and I forgot all about it. But here he is, so not maybe the defeat. Russia was defeated, it was humiliated in 1905. He was eventually returned to Suvalki. Within a year, he married. He saved his money and went to the Red Star Line and booked passage to return to Scranton. This time, I'm staying in Scranton. <laughs> and as in quotes in the dissertation, as his daughter said to me, my father said, working in a mine is dangerous, but it's better than living in Subalki. Oh, <laughs> oh, that's very telling, isn't it? <laughs> there you go. So here we are. He's, his first trip is he's going to travel from Subalki to Antwerp on train. Fourth class, unheated, he sit on a bench. But it was probably very similar to his trek to Siberia on a, in a car that was unheated on a wooden bench. Um, this was a few days, that was several weeks to get there. He will cross, he will cross from Antwerp to New York. There's the Samland that we used in 1907. In its dormitories, third class dormitories, they had room for 1900 immigrants. Oh my God. So here we are. And that's where he is headed. <laughs> so now this is your and I can here's his register of hymns. This is his register of hymns, his favorites. He puts it here on the free end paper on this fly leaf. And then this is where it starts because the handwriting is very nice and organized. And then when you get to this part, it starts to become a little you know haphazard. So these are his hymns. And so the ideas for what I'm working on is to tell the story. Of this hymnal and it's Polish Lutheranism, and then talk about his piety. Because you know he's an unschooled Polish Lutheran, and yet he has this very deep living piety that he expresses. And as his daughter said, he would sit every night reading his prayer book. And in the prayers, at the end of each prayer, there were two or three hymns that were suggested. And that's what gives him the, the, the start. Okay, and so is the first the first prayer he records comes out of Monday morning prayer. So here's Monday morning prayer. And as I said later, it's darker here. This is where his fingers would have, would have held the book, the oil from his fingers. So he spends a lot of time here. And so Monday morning, he gets he gets this, the, the suggested hymn is the first hymn he records in his new deck. So now, how does it speak to you? That's what the whole, this whole thing, this session was to talk about how, what are your favorite hymns? Why, why is it your favorite hymn? What is it, what is it that hymns do for you? All right. 
Um, I, I've been in several Lutheran churches. Okay. And uh, the the song that they used to sing, in, you know, around uh, communion or at the end, create me a clean heart. Oh, I, I mean, and all the different tunes mm. I heard for that song. Mm. That, that- The offertory. Yeah. yeah, it yeah. just, it goes back. Okay, so there's, it's been part of your, your, my, your history. Yes. Okay. Oh. My favorite, I have a lot of favorites. Some of my favorites, how great that, how great that art. Sure. And the reason is it has a history with me of sustaining me at times when I feel that my life is just skewed or uh, it's all awry, that there's nothing that is right, that, you know, I don't know what, what's happening to me. And when I hear those words, I know there is a greater power who loves me and will always be with me. So sustain. Okay. So it sustains you uh, in the valley of the tears. Yes. Beautiful. Thank you. Mm -hmm. A lot of tears. Hi. Okay. It makes me the way you showed your God before. Ah, our spiritual ancestors. Connects her to those who love God. Oh. I can't believe it. She has a quiet voice. I'm thinking louder. Please do that because people who listen to the recordings tell us that they're having they have a hard time hearing. All right. Diane shared with the hymn that's been running through my mind in these past eight days. Um, it's in the ELW. It's this is my song, O God of all the nations. Yeah. 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 That was a Sibelius hymn. Yeah. Be still my soul. Be still my soul. Oh Lord, be still my soul. Yeah, okay. So so um what is it about that hymn? Um the when I think about what's going on in Ukraine, and I think about the Russian soldiers who were told you've got a round trip ticket to Belarus and they'll be coming back on a training exercise, and to their surprise, they're finding out they're invading a country. Um, there are lines in that hymn that say, you know, I love my country, the skies are blue in my country, and the skies are blue in other people's countries, and you're God of all the nations. And <laughs> it's just very, very moving. The words are very. Yeah. <clears throat> but it speaks to the uncertainty mm. of this moment, and yes, and well. the humanity of everybody involved. I, mm. I, I have sympathy for the Russians. I have sympathy for the Ukrainians. Okay. I was at a, <clears throat> a state sale yesterday, and there was this couple, and they were not speaking. I finally, said, "All right." I got to ask, are you Russian? Are you Ukrainian? Are you Ukrainian? And they said, you're we're in Ukraine. Mm -hmm. And I said, how are you doing? And they said, it's it's terrible. It's terrible. And their faces were so pained. And, um, mm -hmm. and then I have a friend, my, our property manager, her daughter right now is experiencing health issues. And part of it is around being bullied because she's Russian. Oh, wow. you know, she's a middle school student. She's wrong? bullied because she's Russian. So there's there's the unifying, uh, the lyrics of that hymn are unifying and loving. Is it just perfect? Mm -hmm. The soldiers are really good. Their cousins, a lot of them. Sure, relatives. Okay. Something popped into my head was um, what a friend we have. It was my mother's. Oh, it was my mother. My mother, my mother, my grandmother played um, it on the piano. Yeah. I taught, I retired, but was a 
preschool and nursery school and elementary school teachers for 40 plus years. And not that I could, we always laugh about this and don't finally do it in public school, but I said, well, I was going to back door with my religion and <laughs> um, teaching young children how to build healthy relationships and friendships and how important they will be. And then you will have friends early in your life and it'll change and depending on your experience as well. Some you'll keep as you go along the way and others will make new friends. Um, but yeah, so I just, I myself, and you didn't talk about Jesus to the students, but I find it comforting to think of um, Jesus as my friend. And then he walked in troubled times, but also in the good times. You know, you share. People say they have lots of different songs, and I always talk about my new favorite song. And my mm -hmm. new favorite. That's going way back <laughs> for me. Most of us can relate to that song. Right. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. My mom played that on the piano. We Mine too. Yeah. <laughs> I think that one has special meaning because most of us learned it as a little kid yeah. early on. Mm -hmm. And those are the ones that stick with. You. Right. You know, especially if you were raised in three synod church every, <laughs> every, every Sunday. Right. And and then during the week. <laughs> and, 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 and it becomes almost a mantra, you know. And to this very day, uh, and that's one thing I love about UTLC is they'll have a, you know, true traditional service with Lutheran liturgy. Every once in a while, when it's one of those songs that I learned by heart as a kid, it instantly transports me back, you know, and that gives me peace and security, and reassurance that it'll be okay, it'll be okay, and that's what the hymns do to me, yeah. among other things. I mean, there's celebration, there's lament, there's all of the above, yeah. and sometimes it's connected to a personal. Time in your life. My favorite is God of Grace, God of Glory, because that's the hymn that the three sessions that were played at my graduation from Concordia College in St. Paul, and I had just gone through a pretty painful divorce and almost quit school, but talked out of it by a team of students, um, and just sort of a reaffirmation I'm going to be okay. And then it was also the recessional hymn at our wedding. Gone. So, so th that that hymn is powerful by itself. Uh, oh, and by the way, both times the organ was played by Paul Mons, so it just blew the roof off, you know. And and so that hymn has a very deep, deep, personal, emotional connection. For those of us who don't know who that is, incredible uh, Lutheran organist. Paul Mons, yes, composer. Well, he's a Musician, he is an or world renowned organist, uh, composer, but his real forte was improvisation. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. and, and, and we were lucky enough to go to the London Church, Mount Olive in Minneapolis, where he was. He was a master when it came to he would they would have hymn fest, <laughs> and the place would be packed, not just yeah. necessarily with members, but when Paul Mons had a hymn fest, mm -hmm. you would they were expecting to be. Blown away anyway, you know, but he could do with that organ anyway. He could coax the congregation into doing men on this one, women on this one, left side on this one, right side on this one, um, a cappella. He'd be playing along, and, and you know, after the first stanza of you know, the verse, third verse, he'd stop playing the congregation, not miss a beat, keep right on going. So it can. Him singing mm -hmm. to me is has the potential of being incredibly powerful, uh, emotional, spiritual, yeah. intellectual. Uh, it, it's it's wonderful, wonderful. Raise your hand enough. if you grew up with that, not of that caliber. Yeah. But we have hot luck singers, and then go into the sanctuary and mm -hmm. sing a choir. Favorite song, favorite yeah. song, and the organist yeah. or the pianist yeah. would play. And you know, and then like okay, this side, this side, mm -hmm. yeah. girls, boys, whatever, brings back a lot of memories. Um, 
<clears throat> I know, excuse me, for a lot of older people, higher. Mm -hmm. What I mean, I have gotten home visits to several. The hymn singing is something that remains to them. Yeah. That, that is something familiar to them and it makes and comforts them. So if when you grow up in that tradition and you have you know, memorize. <clears throat> um, when I was visiting Camp Fiddler, and his mother died, he, she grew up as a Methodist at the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so she had a, a Methodist hymnal, and I would <clears throat> pull it out, and I would say, okay, and I'm, I'm trying to figure out which ones are also in the Lutheran hymnals. <laughs> we can sing these together. <clears throat> she had the first verse of all, almost every hymn memorized. Wow, mm -hmm. she could. <clears throat> that was and sometimes the only provision of, you know, the stuff. Yes. Oh, yeah. I'm sorry, the words put to music reach chords yeah. in us that there's a voice print in our yeah. brain that never goes away. So, sort of like the Lord's Prayer. Even if the person is not, if you say the Lord's Prayer, usually you can see there's some response because it's touched something. Mm -hmm. A little bit. Well, and I, I'd say the connection to the music is so important. Like one of my favorite things is um, Marty Kogan's setting of the three Shepherd Mayo God. And part of it is just the way the music, it just draws you in and it's encouraging you to trust God and to let go of the fears and live fully. And so that it's words and music together that really touches our hearts at a deeper level. I think. And, and you hear the words differently when you just read it. <laughs> I need to say that Elizabeth's father uh, conducted at our seminary for how long? Forever? Forever. But I've heard, I, I never had the privilege of hearing uh, them perform. But I've heard from so many people uh, how much he loved the music and how that was transmitted to anybody sitting there hearing it or anybody participating. To me, that is the real value and, and skill of a person who loves music that you can share it with others in a way that it's like it's yours now. Mm -hmm. You know, it's yours now. I know my brother in law sang in that choir for as long as he was there. How many records did your father have? Tens of thousands. But he gave it, they, they all ended up at the uh, Indiana Symphony. Or yeah. almost all. Yeah. 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 <laughs> he would host something in the house. We, we had church music in the art with your father. Okay. It was a January intercession course, okay. you know, and then the final session was in the house, and we were just sitting there going. <laughs> <laughs> they were under the steps. They were they were all and then looking cranny, and you're like, whoa. <laughs> this is serious. <laughs> this is serious. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, so music has a way of touching us that we 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 it gets to us, and then as you say, the nostalgia, the nostalgia. Uh, this was my mother's favorite hymn. Yes. And so when you sing it, it's like there's that connection. So these are percolating ideas in my head. It's, you know, I don't have Frank here talking to me any longer. So, you know, <laughs> he's not here. But what, what are some of the things? And then what I find interesting is that um, for immigrants um, who came here and then would build their church, you know, when they went to church and sang and the service was done in Slovak, German, or Polish, or whatever. Hungarian, Swedish, Finnish, you know, some of the ethnic groups, you're basically returning home. Mm -hmm. You're yes. spiritually mm -hmm. heading back. Yes. Yeah. And 
particularly on the high holy days, you know, Good Friday, Christmas Eve, you know, um, you were you were, you were no longer there with your parents, your your family, your church family has become your family now, and in a very strong, much stronger way than it was in Europe, intensified. But in that moment, you remembered at yeah, home again. I mean, Silent Night still does that, <laughs> right? When you're holding the candle and the lights have been turned off, and it's it's not Christmas Eve unless you sing Silent Night holding a candle, <laughs> right? Because you've done it forever and ever and ever and ever, and yeah, it's this yeah, moment. Yeah. 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 When I was a child in <clears throat> Philadelphia, there were a number of churches, Irish, uh, oh, is it? Yeah. A German, I mean, that the church right. Polish was was ethnic as well, sure. you know, and I was, I was your heritage, and as you said, like coming home, but it was your security, it was your identity, right. maybe perfect. And it was something you articulated. In, in Suwalki, he didn't need to say, you know, I'm Polish, everybody's Polish. Mm -hmm. But when you're in Scranton, Pennsylvania, all of a sudden, your identity and your faith are intensified. Okay, whereas, and what's amazing about these, this group is like what is amazing about all of Lutheranism. Um, we always arrive speaking a language other than English. Um, and we will build the church from the ground up. Whereas in the homeland, the church was from the top down, it was established by the government, maintained by the government for the landed gentry or a city council. Here, you do it. So the idea of incorporating learning how to incorporate, how to, to do this, you know? And in Scranton, Emmanuel, uh, German and Polish uh, Lutheran church, they work in the mines and in the evenings and then on Sundays, they would go and dig the basement for the church, wow. you know? And so they, this was their, their sanctuary in many ways, shapes and forms. When Frank joined that church, the membership was 700. Yeah. By 19... Racist. 17, they're up to 1,400. Wow. So and they're all mostly from Suwalki. And it starts by Bible study. Mm. You know, they meet in a home. They meet in a home um, somewhere. I'm gonna let somebody in. Mm -hmm. Sorry, I'll, I'll, I'll That's okay. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Mm -hmm. So I mean, they start with Bible study. They start, they meet in somebody's home in the living room and they sing these hymns from this hymnal. They've all brought them with them and they sing hymns. They'll read the Bible, they'll pray. And then when they get to a critical mass, it's like, okay, we can build a church. And then what they normally did is they would contact the Lutheran pastor, the nearby Lutheran pastor, and say, what do we do? <laughs> Tell us what to do. <laughs> the numbers. The numbers were staggering, yeah. yeah. And they, these congregations, this one started out in the Ministerium of Pennsylvania, but it will end up in Missouri Synod. Um, all, all of them ended up in the Missouri Synod. They had far better luck in finding pastors who could speak uh, Polish yeah. and German, so they had far better luck. Uh, still Missouri Synod? Yeah. All of them are, yeah. Oh, there's the lady. <laughs> what did you say it in here? That's why we never heard of them. <laughs> well, they started out in the ministry, but they couldn't they couldn't find a well, banker was coming down from New York City. He had been a pastor uh, in East Prussia in the Missouri districts. Uh, he returned to the United States because he was the pastor for 10,000 parishioners. That's the state church. And it's tiring. Yeah, think. <laughs> you think? <laughs> he was trying to divide the parish to, and get another pastor there for 5,000. And in the state church system, 5,000, you can still do that. You can still do that. Um, but it failed. It failed. So he decided to come back to the states. And we have his catechism, his small catechism in the library at the seminary, the Cross Memorial Library. And in the back cover, there are these names, and those are the confirmands in, in Scranton. Because he would go down once a month on the train from New York to Scranton on the Lackawanna Railroad, full service, teach confirmation, make a visit, then go back to New York City. <laughs> yeah. I felt bad because I got the 
choose him for the year. <laughs> oh, <laughs> yeah. They're all a lot of favor. All right. The one in my early life was um, Beautiful Stable. Oh, oh yes. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I'm surprised nobody mentioned, but oh. um, it was something that sang when it came to the state of the So I went to college with my audition piece for the Wooden Choir. Okay. We would sing that and end up with the Pink <laughs> and I got to meet Brenda Byrne with a big Angola in the great concert, Bailey, or uh, Chris Johnson's version of But culturally, my family, my father's family, Tyresia, right. which was Polish, then German, mm -hmm. and then on our family, but the after the war, it was Polish. Mm -hmm. And it's just great. First, the quiet favorite of mine right now is. Uh, Okay. How about for all the saints? Yeah. Oh my gosh. Oh yes. You know, oh, you yeah. could you could go on and on and on. You're absolutely right. Yeah. You know, as soon as you say the words, the food comes to the brain instant. You know. How about lift high the cross? Oh yeah. yeah. That does a job on me, but I love it. <laughs> Well, but for all the saints, it was one purchase one foundation was a favorite, and it could have put us in touch with our spiritual ancestors. That we're not just forget which one who said it, but I mean, it's that yeah. it connects yeah. us with it was yeah. connects us with our yeah. our ancestors, and we realize <laughs> they are our predecessors, they're our spiritual ancestors, and we didn't get here on our own. And without them, without that, them, that's powerful. That's very yeah. powerful. When you mentioned that. And I was thinking about my mother uh, playing the piano at home and singing hymns, and she would always say, "This was my mother's baby. This was my father's baby." And she wasn't a great piano, she wasn't a great <laughs> voice, but she did that for herself. That was her recreation, you know. Um, and so I had this innate awareness that, oh yeah, this isn't this is just because my mother takes to the church on Sunday. It's because she was raised this way, and 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 um, while you know, she wasn't an immigrant, she was mild enough, and she grew up in a German settlement, mm -hmm. in Minnesota on the prairie, all farmers, German church. She didn't speak English, so she went to uh, ninth grade in the, mm -hmm. in town. Uh, but the point that you have that lineage that it, it, it's not just because of what i'm experiencing it's all this stuff that went before that you become acutely aware of and you realize when you do connect with mm -hmm. who you are and where you are today it worked it worked you know they went through hell um and i'm here as a result and that's powerful in and of mm -hmm. itself there were two polish german polish Lutheran congregations in minnesota there really? was one of the early, the, um, you know where St. Cloud is, right in the middle, right across the Mississippi River, and on the, right across the Mississippi River is Salt Rapids. Oh, well, I know that. Yeah. There's a Polish German congregation, and then you go 10 miles to Popol Creek, further, further east, and that's the second one. What makes that group interesting is they came out of Neidenborg and Soldau, which was the southern district of East Prussia. They settled in Reading, Reading Pennsylvania. And that they were there for a few years, and then they heard of land available in Minnesota, and then moved to, to Minnesota. Uh, it was quite common. You settle in one place, and then it's like, oh. Huh. And what was interesting in the dissertation, because I interviewed people in Salt Rapids, in Popo Creek, in Detroit, in Chicago. Um, you know, it was, there was this inter internal communication network between family and friends. And Frank's brother, John, works in the mines, but then eventually settles in Westfield, Massachusetts, and gets a job in the H.P. Smith Company, which is still operating, creating uh, heat boilers and, and heating and plumbing equipment. And uh, he's, why, he gets there. Why? There's a German Polish congregation. A, descent, a, a, descent, a family member settles in Dundalk, Maryland. Why Dundalk, Maryland? There's a German Polish congregation. So the letter was, the letter was, oh, this one's paying a dime, a dime a day, you know. That's, and there's a, like, there's a job there, but there's also family and friends. And you know that when you're in that transition stage, they'll help you. Right. You know, you're, yeah. you've right. got the, the, that social right. net that's not guaranteed elsewhere. 
So it's just the, the church takes on a whole, whole new dimension. Yeah. Hey, Dottie. Hi. <laughs> I am a fan of a show on PBS, Finding Your Roots. Oh, oh yes. And what I appreciate so much in that is when he asks the question, do you think that what these people went through or what happened to them is somehow in you? And invariably, the person says yes. And I'm sitting here thinking, listening to these stories, that all the people who came before us in the church, and I mean, there was no question that, that I would be a part of our church because it was my history. I right. can trace it back to New York, by the way, my great great whatever traveled with it mm -hmm. here in Pennsylvania. And it's like my heritage. And yeah, this is who I am. And listening to your stories, I think. Here we are in this room carrying out the history before us. Mm -hmm. And I think that is just such a gift and so magnificent that we do that. Mm -hmm. I'm done. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, the church is one foundation. Yeah. Yeah. I worry about our children going passing down. This rich parish in our Right. That's a question only you can answer. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because they aren't coming to church. They aren't going to church. No. Well, are they learning any of these things? No, no, they're not coming to church. <laughs> well, but I, I think if they were exposed to it, it's there. You know, I remember listening to a Pretty good talk show of this stuff. Catholic priest was on talk about this stuff. This is a long time back. And it's call it's calling show, and this woman called in and said, Well, yeah, you said you quote the scripture that says uh, you know, mothers and fathers bring up your uh, children, nurture and admonition of the Lord, and it shall not be part. And that's not the case. And she goes on and on. And says, well, I didn't finish the verse. I said. Uh, parents bring up their children the nurture and admonition of the Lord they will not depart in their old age. Oh. You just got to hope they make it to old age. <laughs> if, if it's planted, it's there. Our youngest daughter, Lark, doesn't go to church. She's a Christian in her definition, but she's a, what do you call that? She's spiritual. 32, what is that, millennial? I don't know what she is, oh, but she's oh, one oh. of those spiritual, but not religious. But uh, she did. She recently moved up to Allentown for a new job on his volunteer work and, and did this, this nursing home. I love it when she tells the story. The nursing home and the, the, the volunteer work. And, uh, and uh, so the, the volunteer coordinator is asking her, what, what do you do? Well, I played well, I, I, I the piano. She said, oh, uh, that would be nice. Uh, what can you play? Uh, and she said, I can play hymns. And the coordinator says, Oh, wonderful. They love hymns. <laughs> yes. and, 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 you know, Don and I were gratified that, well, yeah, okay, of all the things she could have said, she said, Well, I can play hymns, you know. And she can't, you know, like my mother, not well, but well enough for the, for the you rest recognize of the, the tune. You recognize the And you can sing. You can sing it. Yeah. And um, so it, it may not be obvious. But it's there. You we know? do plant the seed, and sometimes we don't see the harvest. Exactly right. Yeah. yeah. We don't know what's going to happen. Yeah. yeah. We plant the seed, and we don't. Sometimes we just we don't to see get, the harvest. You know, because that that's where you have to trust God. You know, it's in His hands. Okay. Or I'm, her hands. Unconscious of time. You yeah. have, it's ten thirty. Yeah. Perfect yeah. timing. Thank you. For we got to you got to come back yeah. again. You know, yeah. this is great. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> this is great. Thank you. Yeah. 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 Yeah.